Hi, thank you. Um, it's really lovely to be here. And uh, I was totally blown away by everything we saw last night, particularly the whale uh, and the garden. I thought they were just wonderful. Um, but I'm going to slightly change the tone, I think, away from uh, talking about light. But I'm going to talk about what's probably the most important part, I think, of the culture of a city, and that's its food system. And People don't think about the food system. I and mean, if you ask them about cities on the whole, they tend to talk to you about the buildings and the infrastructure and the housing problem and the, this problem or the, that solution or the wonderful thing. But actually, food is so entwined with cities that the history of food and the history of the city cannot be divorced because you can't, you can't have a city unless you've solved a food problem. And in London, I... I'm not quite sure that I can say the same for Durham. I clearly can't say the same number, but I think Durham has probably, if it has 100,000 people, let's say it's serving up 300,000 meals a day, that's a lot. But you look at London with the amount of people who commute into it, and every single day in London, we serve up something like 30 million meals. Now, if you think about it, it, it's actually unthinkable to think of getting in that amount of raw produce, where it's got to come from across the world, as it going to arrive on your dish or your shop as a raw product or as a processed product? How is it going to be transported? How is it going to be stored? Think of the millions of transactions that go into buying it, the people that are involved in that chain, and then think of the kind of some of the more ghastly consequences, like certainly in a city, the huge quantities of waste. And uh, I think, I mean, some of you may have been watching Hugh Fernley Whittingstall's terrific couple of programs the last couple of weeks on the subject of food waste. You know, and it's it's a huge issue. They're all huge issues because food is simply enormous. And pretty much it has to be said, because it's such a mind-boggling thing, that governments everywhere, and we can go, and I'm going to go back in time now very fast, but governments everywhere have been very, very happy. Uh, deeply relieved, in fact, to say, okay, this is a problem that we're going to hand to the private sector. We're going to hand to the, the guy who can come up with the best solution that seems to work the best for the moment. So, yes, we could say, if you ask people, they say, is the food system efficient? And you say, well, it has to be efficient. It's feeding 30 million people a day. But, but, in the last 30 years, something really, 30, 40 years, something really drastic has happened. And we're now looking at a planet where we have roughly nearly 2 billion people who are hungry, coming up for 2 billion people who are fat, overweight, getting diabetes, uh, going to, in kids, uh, I was talking to someone who just came back from Gata, 60% of 11 year olds are dangerously obese and developing diabetes. And then you have a small number of people who seem to be doing fine. So can you call that system a success? I would say you could have to call it actually one of capitalism's and the free market's really big failures. But let's take cities, and that's where I'm going to start and go back in time about how this happened, if I can manage it in a short space of time, because cities created the problem, but I believe cities can solve the problem, and I'll try and tell you why. So, the origins of agriculture, as everybody knows, well, I know, anyway, they're very, um, they're very obscure. They, nobody really knows. It was kind of in the breadbasket of the world. It was kind of in the area of uh, Iraq, um, Syria, I mean, places that now, as far as I can see, are producing absolutely nothing, where everything could be produced in the past. And if you were a hunter-gatherer, you couldn't, you couldn't have a city, because you spent your whole time looking for food. So there was no question of putting down roots. So the big thing that had to happen, someone had to figure out how to grow grain, grain was the first thing, how to store it, and, and then how to cook it. And the first thing that was produced was a kind of funny, mushy stuff that you made out of grain. You could say it was the very early bread, didn't have yeast in it. And it sounds kind of quite healthy, but if you look at uh, origins, the ancestral origins of bones, actually we had terrible teeth. So people don't really quite know enough about it. But the, the grain was the, was the first food that you could store in large enough quantities that a certain number of people could say, okay, I'm not going to look for food anymore. And that began, became the idea that we could stay still. We could then start to build uh, villages, villages could turn into towns. The people who were saying, I'm going to be the person who's in charge of the law and of making pictures and of doing all the things that then became the great triumph of the human spirit and the human creativity was made possible because not everybody had to look for food. So the first settlements in Palestine, and they grew from little villages into cities, but they only grew, and this is really important to remember because this is why Manira, my colleague, can start to talk about megacities. They only grew 
in exact proportion to the amount of food that could be got on a regular basis to the citizens of those cities. There was no point in putting 10 million people in one place if, in fact, you had no system in which to feed them. It just didn't happen. So you have to look at the whole history of cities in entire, like this, with the food system. And actually, the, big, the first great city, of course, because it was the first great city of everything, was Rome. And Rome was very, very sophisticated about where they got food from. They actually got oysters from Britain, which I find a bit difficult to believe, so I'm not quite sure how they transported them. But, you know, the, the reasons they attacked Egypt, attacked Carthage, was to get their hands on the grain and in that North African, amazing North African belt. They were getting two to three grain harvests a year then because they had brilliant irrigation systems. And because they had the food, they could grow and they could become very, very, very sophisticated in terms of their laws and everything. So you have to think of a city like London before the Industrial Revolution, because this is also another really big key thing about food, is that in those days, nobody would have been in any illusion where the food came from, because you walked cows into the city. In fact, a lot of cattle used to come from up north or around here. They would be, took me three hours on the train yesterday, it would take a cow a heck of a lot longer to walk to London. But those cows used to walk to London, and apparently they used to lose 100 pounds in weight by the time they got there. So they would be fattened up in Islington. Islington was absolutely full of meadows. The cows would be fattened up, killed, and then sold to the people in the city. At its high point, London apparently had a, it had a herd of 20,000 milk cows all living around the city, and the milkmaids would get up at three in the morning and they'd milk them, and then they'd distribute milk. So you had streets like Bread Street, you had poultry, you had the markets. You knew your food. You could smell it, you could hear it, you could taste it, you could step in it, whatever. Probably not very hygienic, but my God, you knew what it was. So cut forward again, another, another big jump, and you get to the point where you have a train, and the train suddenly says, oh, I've taken that distance away, I can bring those cows in in a few hours. And suddenly they can go straight into the Smithfield Market, and the same thing happens the moment you get refrigeration. And as you get more and more and more sophisticated methods of transport, storage, and keeping things, then suddenly what happens is the people in the city food is just, well, what's the difference between food and this jacket or this t-shirt? It's something that's come from the outside and it's gone into a shop. And that's kind of all very well, except that from my point of view, where I sit as the mayor's food advisor, you know, it's pretty scary to bump into a child who says, spaghetti grows on trees? Do carrots come out of the ground? And all this. And But you could say again, well, does that matter? Well, as I think I said at the beginning, yes, it does matter because it means that as a society now, we started to cease to be able to distinguish between what's food and what's processed. So this is another going to be another extremely fast gallop as to how did this happen? Now, in the 1970s, when processed food uh, became suddenly a reality. The whole systems of industrialization of food, which started after the war to say, we've got to suddenly feed these incredibly fast growing populations. We had all these things called green revolutions. They got taken over by bigger and bigger corporations whose interest ceased to be health. And something very odd seemed to happen, or to my mind seemed to happen, was that we divorced the idea that what we ate mattered. It was more about the calories we got. And that if you ask particularly a bloke and you say, if you bought a very fast Maserati and it was your pride and joy, you wouldn't put Coca-Cola in the tank and expect the thing to go like a bomb, would you? Actually, it would go like a bomb. It would probably blow up. Um, but we're very happy to treat our, our own personal Maseratis in exactly that way. So for the corporations in the 70s, key things happen. They discovered that they could produce mass-produced food and they could make it very cheap. And the population really liked that. And the governments loved it. Because what was able to happen was that households that used to spend roughly, this is rough, but it's an accurate rough, 30% of the household income every week went on food. That figure dropped down to about 10%. And that 20% gave us our consumer revolution. It gave us our flat screen televisions and our holidays in the Costa del Sol and our cars and our new garages and our extensions. And it became a situation where governments had to say, we cannot let food prices go up. Food prices have to stay down. And this became a thing all over the world. But at the same time as this, it, 
what, for a corporation to make money, there is very little mileage, money-wise, in a cabbage or a carrot or a single stick of broccoli. It is what it is. You can't put much of a markup on it. But you stick uh, cream cheese sauce on top of that cauliflower, whatever it is, and suddenly you can start to make a lot of money. Things got very rapidly, as far as I can see, and I think the world can see, out of control. And roughly between about the start of the 1980s and now, which if you think about it on an evolutionary basis, is not even the blink of an eye in terms of our bodies and in terms of the way we react and absorb and consume food. The world has gone ill as a result of the food system. And it drives me nuts when you read sort of columns in the sun or whatever, and they say, it's all personal responsibility. It's all the fatties' fault. It's because they can't curb their appetite. This is a message, by the way, that is constantly pushed by companies like Coca-Cola who say, just be sensible about it and all you need to do is run it off. If that was the case, would, at the current rating, 57% of American adults in 30 years have all lost their will, have all somehow mysteriously become different species that can't stop eating? No, the thing that has happened is that the environment has changed. So going back to what I said at the beginning was that the governments love the food system. They've loved it so much that we have no department in our government, or indeed anywhere, that deals with food per se. What we have instead is food and farming in DEFRA. We have a bit of stuff in diet and health in the health department. We have a bit in the Department of Education. We have a whole lot in the business departments about the creation of industry. Nobody thinks this is actually above and before everything. This is the greatest single human need. Nobody is in charge of it. Enter the cities at this point, because I don't believe governments are absolutely uh, battered by different competing interests. They're battered by the big companies. I mean, I don't know if anyone clocked it, but it's just, it gives you a very quick, very recent illustration. And after Jamie Oliver's program about sugar, about six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, two days afterwards, Coca-Cola take out three page adverts in the mail, in the Evening Standard and in the Daily Express, I think they were in as well. And on the first one, it said, Coke equals happiness. The second one, it says, Coke, working for you. We have a brand to suit every time. You know, this calorie is that calorie. And on the third page, it says, Coke, creating jobs for Britain. We create 41,000 jobs or whatever it was. That was the tank on the lawn of the Treasury. That was them saying, don't screw with us. We are bigger than you. Do not put on a sugar tax. Do not start to say things. Because, of course, they're terrified now that their profits might be eroded. But let's go back to see where the city can do something. Because it's my belief that if you want to change any... We have to get in right into the heart of the culture here to change it. You have to change so many things. And this is why it defies a government thing. Governments will say, and indeed I often get asked, they say, what's one thing that you could do? Just, just give me one thing. And of course you have to say, there is no one thing. There is no one thing. If we do a tax, that is only a part of it. Because actually we have, to, we have to look at what you eat in schools, what you eat in the home, what you sell on the high street, what you do in the supermarkets, what you do in the hospitals, what you do in every single level of this hugely, amazingly complicated system. And I think of it like a swimming pool. And at the moment, the kind of projects we do don't join up enough that the water level gets deep enough to swim in. But we're in the city here, and that, therefore that means we can connect the amazing things that are happening on the grassroots with what I think we need to see, which is some serious regulation coming in from the government, much the same way that the tobacco industry had it. And what I think is very scary about the tobacco industry, which in a way, compared to the food industry, is incredibly simple. It took 50 years from when the absolute medical knowledge that cigarettes were really bad for you and were possibly going to kill you, 50 years before one morning got onto a packet. That was the power of the lobby. And all those lobbyists now work for the food companies. So we're up against big concerns. We're up against big things. But what is wonderful is what you see happening. And Manira talked about how culture and events help people connect in cities when they're strangers to each other. But actually, I think the biggest connector is food and eating together and growing together and sharing things. And that one of the things that has made our society so much poorer is the fact that so many people don't even have 
dining room tables, not even whether it's in a dining room, but even the table around which you can eat. It breaks my heart when I'm in takeaways and you're trying to have an argument with them about what they're selling and they'll say, yeah, but you know the amount of people who come in here for their evening meal, because that is, that is their, their place of sharing food and being together. So it, it ain't easy, but we have, we have done all sorts of projects like we are putting gardens into every single school in London. We have created 2,600 community gardens where we have people of all ages and all cultures growing their, and I'm over my time, oh, growing their fruit and vegetables together. And the thing is, what I think is that we can create the net at the bottom, which will start to move the water level up. And if, as the city, we scream at the government at the top to put the regulation in, eventually we'll make that water deep enough to change the way we're swimming. Thank you.